Welcome to Emerging Technology Horizons. I'm Dr. Mark Lewis. I'm the Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technologies Institute. And with me on this episode is Mackenzie Eaglin, who is a Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, at AEI, uh, Mackenzie works on defense strategy, defense budgets, and military read readiness writ large. She's a regular guest lecturer at local universities. Uh, she's on the board of advisors of the Alexander Hamilton Society. Um, and she's a member of the steering committee of the Leadership Council for Women in National Security. Um, Mackenzie is no stranger to, to issues related to national defense and, and technology. Uh, before joining the American Enterprise Institute, uh, she worked on defense issues in the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Uh, and at the Pentagon, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and, and uh, particularly uh, also on the, on the Joint Staff. Um, she's a very prolific writer on defense-related issues, uh, has been published extensively in the popular press, very, very influential writings, um, including Foreign Affairs, New York Times, Politico, uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, Washington Post, and War on the Rocks. And, and she's given congressional testimony that, again, has been very, very influential. Mackenzie has a master's from the Edmund A. Wall School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and a bachelor's from Mercer University. So, Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining me, joining me for this discussion. Um, and and yeah, I'm looking forward to getting your, your, your thoughts on modernization, some of the, the limitations, some of the challenges. And, and let, me, let me start off by, by, by picking your brain a bit. How do we enable new technologies and, and their associated capabilities? Well, we're also, and this is the big question, this is, you know, while standing one leg, answer this question, how do we do that? Well, we're also carrying legacy systems, we're burdened with acquisition challenges, inefficient processes, and, and making it even more complicated, we've got the added stakeholders of, as we let, some of us like to say, 535 members of the board of directors of the Pentagon sitting on Capitol Hill. How do we break through all that lockdown? Well, oh gosh, where do I begin? Thanks for having me. Um, I want I could break down. So I, I kind of want to touch on each component of that question. So remind me at the end which ones I forget, because you know the hill is easier. Okay. I think than I, I think we make them out to be harder than they really are. Um, but I want to get to Congress at the end um, if if we can, and kind of start with the department's structural in many cases issues. Um, you know, outdated processes, um, poor data collection, poor information storage and security. I mean, there's just so many issues here, of course. Um, and then, of course, enough acquisition reform to fill, you know, if we printed it, it could fill my office and yours, right? So there's just, there's so yep. much out there. The barnacles of bureaucracy always, um, you know, grow and add on, but very little ever gets taken away, right? So when we do acquisition reform, it's like in addition to an, the system or to bypass the system, when instead I really wish we would focus on what, what can be stopped or taken away. Um, so that's just kind of like big picture. What do we know firstly? We're hearing at all the trade shows this fall, right? All the service trade shows that, you know, software is the future tech, you know, I mean, the term is often technology, but I think DOD leaders most often mean software. And so what do we know about that? We know that in the future, anything the department buys, software has to be built in, the upgradability has to be built in from the start. But that's not enough. Every weapon system can't have its own standard, right? So there needs to be common plumbing among right. all of the systems and it needs to be monopolistic and open. And so there has to be one point person in charge of doing that very uncool but important job. That's number one. Number two is, you know, this legacy question is really tricky. And capital intensive services like the Air Force and the Navy, you know, they, they know this. If you want a hole in the water or an airplane in the sky, you know, uh, and you're a chief, you need to think about that today for five years from now. You know, that iron on the ramp doesn't come for five or six years. And, you know, combatant commanders are on a different timetable. They want everything now, right? They want to, to perform their global presence missions now. And so you actually need a lot of stuff. You just can't have great software alone. You need to have it in and on something, right, to, to accomplish the job. And so in many cases, I think that the legacy debate is, is poorly understood, and I think the department needs to lead on this. In many cases, we're going to need to put new technology on old stuff, right, as opposed to buying new stuff, which the department does not have a really good track record of doing. See, like the DDG-1000, the Zoom Next Generation Destroyer, right? Unfortunately, there's too many cases like that. And so, but we don't want to copy the ancient Roman tactic of burning the bridge behind us, right? So as the right. department innovates right. now and, do, and really no longer invents much of anything, 
uh, they've got to use some of these legacy systems as technology playgrounds. The Army's actually done this to great effect with a couple of different systems. In some cases, they'll need to buy new, like totally new, like a next generation future vertical lift, right? Um, but I really think that should be the standard for what's legacy. Uh, so, you know, can, can you do what I just described on a certain system? So for example, like aircraft carriers, that's often a big debate. Are those legacy? Well, maybe, but the Ford can generate three times the electrical power of its predecessor. And that's exactly the kind of power you need for directed energy, for lasers, um, for rail guns, all the things that the Navy wants in the future. So I'm going to stop there and then right. see if you want to dive in any of those or we can talk Congress next. No, that's really good. So, so you know, you, it, it, but but still, it's an interesting quandary. You you might put the laser on the aircraft carrier, but the aircraft carrier itself might no longer be as relevant in a future fight in a future scenario. How, how do you how do you balance that? Um, I, I I I by the way, I will tell you, I'm 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 a really big fan of putting advanced technology on legacy systems. I you know you know I'm 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 passionate about hypersonic systems, and I love the idea of putting hypersonic weapons on fourth generation mm -hmm. fighters, for example, or in legacy bombers to give them new capability. Right. So you know, and I think that's one of the parameters uh, under debate. Like, is legacy defined as as a platform system or capability that is not relevant to certain operational challenges in the national defense strategy. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's part of it. But if you put on top of it what I, in addition to it, I guess you could say my proposed definition and why would they have to be together? Partly because of what I described as this sort of co combatant commander versus service chiefs tension that exists all the time. The chiefs have to man, train, and equip. The COCOMs just consume that supply of forces and readiness and training, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have as many forces forward today, though, as at the height of the wars, and we're not in a shooting war, right? They're just doing the flying, sailing, steaming, and driving of global presence every day. Right. So that's assurance, deterrence, dissuasion, persuasion, all these other things that I think that the department classifies as competition now. And you need, you know, you need stuff to get there and do all of the mission as it were. And so if we only, you know, define legacy based around an operational challenge, which means hostilities typically, um, you're going to lose a lot of capacity that you need for the presence missions that consume really the force. So I guess, you know, I, 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 if I can, if I can pull that thread a bit, I think in terms of the B-52 bomber as a, a, an aircraft that was built as a, you know, strategic nuclear bomber and then finds itself, it finds its, it finds use in so many, so many different ways today, yep. including close air support. Um, is, is it, it sounds like that's that's kind of that, that's what you're alluding to and now now we see the b-52s are going to be you know where they're going to be re-engined and they're going to be operating um for decades to come it's remarkable isn't it I, that wall street journal article yeah. that ran on it was incredible yeah. because you know uh grandfathers everywhere were like <laughs> yeah b-52 yeah. this eisenhower era aircraft is still highly relevant but it's evolved um, you know, when we looked yeah. at this at AEI in our tri-service modernization report, you know, basically what, what you see structurally, as I mentioned at the outset, that the challenges facing the department, is they're in an operations and sustainment cost death spiral, right? So those two things are eating the funds to buy and invest in all these uh, legacy, legacy system recapitalization efforts, right? The combat aircraft, fighting vehicles, et cetera. And it's not the cost of the new system itself is per se too much. It's that the cost of operating the old stuff is too high. Um, so you need the new stuff even more, right? But uh, what you do see in some cases, to your point on the B-52, is that uh, there are certain systems that have hit their upgrade limit, right? So while, while the B-52 has evolved, so to speak, I guess is a term over time, um, uh, others just like, you can you can fix the wings, but the engines cracked or Longeron or the you know the hull of this yeah, or yeah. the power you know. Yeah. So in, in those those systems self eliminate right as legacy right. They just there's nothing else you can do, um, and that in many cases, for example, um, some of the cruiser fleet. So uh, I, I would take 
take the legacy when it's obvious, accept it and, you know, try and, and, right. and do what you can to replace it. And then, right, with those B-52s out there or with the Army's improved Bradley or it's AM, it's, um, but they have another uh, vehicle, some, some goggle headsets that they're working on. These are opportunities to innovate on older stuff. Right. I know I can tell you from firsthand experience, I, I would often run into the challenge inside the Pentagon. And when people compare costs, they're comparing costs of acquiring a new system to the cost of the existing system. So we got into that discussion, for example, on you know, next generation weapons, and you had the, the cost account. Kind of but we already have lots of weapons, and we've already paid for them. And, and so convincing folks of making that initial investment on the new technology is, is, is sometimes the hurdle. And, and, uh, and I don't have an easy solution to that one except to keep, keep pounding my fist on the table and saying, you need to consider the whole cost. It's the whole system. It's a sustainment. And oh, by the way, it's the cost per effect, not the cost Absolutely. per weapon. Absolutely. Well said. So, so let me, but if I can, so, so you, you promised to talk a little bit about Congress. Yes. Uh, so, so then we circle back because they, you know, Congress has certainly weighed in on, on a couple of legacy platforms. The A-10 with the Air Force, of course, comes comes immediately to mind. Um, how do we get to get get Congress to buy in on 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 if necessary retiring legacy mm -hmm. systems when 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 their time has passed? Like I said, I mean, I, they can be a tricky body. However, they're yep. not as difficult as I think their reputation is to work with, but it does take time and effort, right? There's no substitute for the shoe leather approach, as in, you know, member by member, office by office of, of committees of jurisdiction, right? Nobody has time to meet with, you know, all of Congress and, right. and occasionally leadership and occasionally, you know, um, like a, a budget committee, you know, for example, certain committees, depending what the debates of the day are. Uh, but that makes it a more manageable group to, to work with. Um, and, and being, you know, members of Congress consider the chiefs their peers. So when the chief sends deputies and others, it's, you know, things can often get um, hairy. Uh, yeah. And they have long, members of Congress have long memories, right? So I was talking to one of the chiefs who was telling me a funny story, like, you know, I went in for my meeting with the senator on the committee and I was feeling pretty good because, you know, we just stood up unit X, Y, Z. And I'm like, the staff's like, you know, high-fiving me on the way in. And I sit down and he, you know, yelled at me for five things that my predecessors had done. And I said, you know, that's exactly how it works, right? You, you're... Yeah. You know, you, there's baggage, there's organizational history and baggage that precedes that person that have to be reckoned with. Uh, and there needs to be continuity in the department. You know, if, there, if, if some chief wants to start something and it doesn't get approved in year one or year two, right? They need to prep their successor because, right. you know, getting something into the bloodstream of Congress is, is important before you get often final passage of something, right? And that can take two to four to five years. Um, but it can right. be done. Um, in some cases, you know, members of Congress are simply parochial, right? We saw the Air Force uh, secretary who will be uh, unnamed, but uh, there was a big debate on Capitol Hill like five years, four years ago. And uh, members of Congress of a certain state and delegation were worried about a certain aircraft capability going away. And its follow-on replacement was like some system of systems, so not an airplane. And... They were able to get the affected state totally on board with an equal number of jobs, right? Not airplanes. Mm -hmm. Weren't able to commit to mm -hmm. getting this state the same number of airplanes. And it worked. So sometimes there's just good old fashioned deal making. Um, and then what I really have seen over the years is you need buy-in from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, right? So there's one top cover when the services are trying to make their case. Uh, two, it's a priority, right? So it's not just this parochial service interest. Uh, it's a wider departmental interest, um, you know, where uh, when there's pushback from Congress, right? Then behind them, you have the secretary or the deputy and, and that they have sustained attention to this, right? You know, I was disappointed in the 22 defense budget request, you know, that I kind of think their bumper sticker has been divest to invest and the leadership took you know, the civilian leader said, you know, we've got basically $3 billion in here of, of th all of things like cruisers. We want to retire so we can get on to the new emerging technologies. 
and they didn't get a lot of what they asked for. And that's really unusual when the same party controls the executive branch and the White House and the Congress. They should have gotten everything right. they asked for. <laughs> everything and they asked why didn't they? I, yeah. There just wasn't enough sustained attention or interest from OSD. They have to constantly be pushing on it. They have to constantly be asking. They need White House cover you know, in their statement of administration policy when the bills come out. Um, if you have that, basically this unity in the department between the civilians and the uniform side, you can actually accomplish a lot. And a little bit of um, tough talk and bullying selectively from the Secretary of Defense personally when it's required. So, um, you know, my, my own experience at the, you know, especially working with, with Secretary Esper and Deputy Secretary Norquist, they could be incredibly powerful and they, when they leverage the full prestige of their office. Um, you, now, you mentioned, you mentioned the 22 budget. And you know, from a from a technology standpoint, there are some things that I really liked in that 22 budget. Obviously, yeah. we in the previous administration had put a big plus up in in hypersonics, and that survived pretty much intact. Um, other aspects of emerging technologies, um, it, there was a hit on basic research that uh, a little bit concerning, frankly. But overall, it was a you know, from the S and T side, it was a it was a significant plus up. Um, I. I I, I'll be interested to see if that continues in the 23 budget. But any any other any other comments on the 22 budget or anything that you saw that jumped out at you? You know, uh, well, I wasn't too surprised that Congress is signaling you know, that there are more votes to increase defense than to to fund the administration's request, and it's partly because of what we've been talking about this whole time, which is just this unyielding global demand for forces, right? So. Uh, you know, Congress looked to those services, those unfunded priority lists, but really, I think if they had to describe their plus ups, it was all about China, right? It's all about the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, which includes emerging technology and many other things, but it includes um, bolstering posture in the region. So, you know, there's like military construction funding, for example, uh, Guam defense funding, um, but it's also for new platforms and, and, and so in some cases, new technology. So. Uh, I think that this is a longer project. I think Congress will continue to do the same thing um, uh, in, in 2023. Um, and I also, you know, what's really interesting is, that, you know, talking about kind of, sometimes they can be helpful. Sometimes they can be a hindrance. Sometimes they can be helpful, but then cause more problems. And so I was really glad to see that they uh, are standing up a commission to look at the planning right. processes at the department, which I'm sure you've been following. And, you know, this is really inside baseball stuff, but it does need a relook. Uh, it's time for a refresh. This doesn't normally rise to the interest of, of Congress, but it's, it's proof positive that, you know, acquisition reform, there's been so much focus on that for the last 10 years. Um, it's actually the right next logical place. Like we shouldn't be over reforming acquisition just for the sake of change for change's sake, which is really what I think they were doing in the later years, just like looking for things to do. Um, and then of course, you know, what I would love to see, Mackenzie would love to see uh, the next phase of reform after this planning, programming, budgeting reform commission is where Congress starts to reform itself. Yeah, that's that's right. like pie in the sky, you know, I, I really yeah, <laughs> pipe dream yeah. kind of stuff. <laughs> Like there are certain things that the Defense Department could do so much better um, and faster, particularly with technology. But in some cases, they've hit the limits what they can do internally. They now need appropriators, frankly, to give up some power and move, you know, give them more flexible funds, bigger right. pots of money, not slushy pots, but like, you know, just bigger baskets like in the army. Right. If you took their 130 plus R&D lines and put it into like a dozen baskets for funding and more discretionary you know authority by the army to work with that money as opposed to you know everything a line item i i feel like you could go a lot faster so yeah <laughs> agree go go you know you, 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 there are clearly aspects of our of our acquisition process our funding process that that limits the speed at which we can go i, I you know the, the idea of having a palm cycle so you have to be planning years in advance certainly you know, number of folks have called out as 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 one of the challenges to introducing emerging technologies as, as quickly as we might like. I think I think Heidi Shu in her congressional testimony or confirmation hearing actually specifically called that out. It was it was it was good to hear. Um, so you know, we talked a little bit about budget. I know you you have some thoughts on the national defense strategy, um, and especially what what might be coming in the next national defense strategy. 
and 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 what should be coming in the national defense strategy. Um, you know, as the saying goes, pre uh, it, uh, predictions are hard, especially about the future. Um, but but looking ahead to the next national defense strategy, what do you think we ought to see? So I know inside the building, you know, they're trying to integrate all the varying strategies underway right now, right? The nuclear posture review, the global posture look, and then the defense strategy. We know a fair amount already of where they're going to go in this in this case. Uh, and there isn't a lot of secret sauce here because we have the White House's interim strategic guidance and we have a lot of comments and statements from the secretary and others. So what do we know? Um, we know that the watchword, so to speak, or the bumper sticker will be integrated deterrence. Um, you know, global power, um, excuse me, great power competition will be dropped as the term du jour. And it'll be something like principled or strategic competition. I think it's very similar, but different words. Um, but what is integrated deterrence? I think that's kind of the big question. And again, here, we kind of know though what it is already. Um, so the White House is signaling basically it's a broader, expansive uh, consideration of national security, right? So um, domestic renewal is part of national security, right, right? right? So climate change is much more important. Current and future pandemic relief and response is part of that. Um, equity and inclusion uh, are also part of that. And so, uh, but more specifically to defense, I think it also means that, you know, the department leadership considers themselves as one or rowing the, the boat forward of many to compete well with China, right? DOD is not going to be the sole leading or even leader at all effort in that. Uh, and of course that, you know, allies more specifically need to do more and we need to do more for them for doing more. <laughs> Uh, and so that's where I see everything headed, and that's all signals are indicating as much. One interesting thing, uh, uh, or helpful, I guess I could you could say, one helpful initiative that's likely to come out of the new strategy is that, so the 2018 strategy was the first to really, as you know, reorient the department at, entirely on, on the five threats, but primarily China. Um, this one, I think, will reaffirm of course, the five threats, but it's going to put a greater emphasis on the homeland, right? Where missiles now are within reach of varying adversaries to our homeland and other capabilities, not just space and cyber. So they're going to talk more about that. And then, um, but it's going to delineate China as first among equals in the threat list, right? It's it, very specifically, I'm not saying the last team didn't think that, but it's going to basically call out our competition or long-term competition with China as, as the first priority of the department, not 1A and Russia 1B. Yeah. It's going to be number one and number right. two. Right. No, that makes sense. Although I will tell you, we, you know, when I was, when, when I was most recently in the building, I'm, I'm going to stop with the back when I was in the building, but when I was most recently in the building, I mean, it, China, China was our number one concern. And I, I, I would, I would argue there wasn't a day that, that, that I and the research and engineering team walked in the building that first, first and foremost in our mind was, was competition with China. Um, and, and I will tell you that, you know, I, I had some concerns that that might shift with an administration change, and I'm, I'm, I, I would agree with you that I'm, I'm not seeing that. Um, we're hearing, we're hearing very similar comments coming out of the, the current team as we, we heard from the previous team. So, so, thoughts then on, on China. How, how do we compete with China? I know that's the, the grand question, and it's one of the reasons we set up the Emerging Technologies Institute. How do we compete with China? Given that you know uh, dictatorships can be very efficient, they can move quickly. They don't worry. They don't have acquisition issues that we we have. They can they can dedicate resources from the top down. How do we compete with that? Well, none of the answers would surprise you, uh, and you you can certainly tell me much better. But uh, in everything, we have to go faster. In everything, you know, we talk about maybe a new cruiser or a new frigate or a new destroyer, and maybe from the first thought to, you know, bending metal to hole in the water, your best case scenario is 10 years, right? I Meanwhile, China's like, hey, built three frigates this year, here you go. They have the largest army, the largest Navy, the largest Coast Guard, the largest maritime militia, the largest sub-strategic nuclear force in the world, right? So numbers actually do matter, along with, um, you know, moving quickly. Uh, I mean, new concepts, new training, new posture, all that's important, but we also still have to you know, build stuff and acquire stuff like new emerging technology. 
in relevant time frames. Um, so going faster, however that is, and it's actually touching on a lot of things we've talked about, right? So like in some cases, this is going to be congressional. They're going to have to let, they're going to have to, unfortunately, they may, I don't know how it'll come about. It might be a spectacular failure, but Congress has to take its boot off the neck of the department and the data it's, you know, asks for and the oversight it requires, you know, multi-thousand page bills. Meanwhile, the department's sending over, you know, millions and millions pages of pages of, of uh, information every year. And so, you know, fixing that relationship too and streamlining it, that's part of it. So going faster just in everything, streamlining it. A lot of the software, you know, um, issues that we've talked about, the upgradability, it's built in from the start. Um, thinking differently about it. All, you know, it's funny, I was at AUSA last week speaking on two different panels and it was, it was, you know, in some cases, service leaders, you know, they understand the importance of, say, software and technology in the competition, right? Because they see disinformation. They see how their Tesla and their iPhone can do way more than DOD can do, right? And it's, they're going to be 10 years behind that technology. Um, they see, they see all of the challenges, but yet it's, I heard in some cases at the Army sh um, trade show, you know, still this, this concept of thinking where it's like, here's our new concept of operation, show us, you know, bring us the technology solution. And I really think you have to turn the telescope fundamentally in terms of thinking about this, right? Where it's defense leadership looks around, surveys all of the technology available, and then goes and writes a concept around that. Just based, just what's available, not trying to invent it you know, new per se. When you, when you invent it new, great. But really, like I said, the department's not an inventor anymore. It's really just an innovator. I mean, perhaps you disagree. But, um, you know, I, I had a colleague of mine at AEI and I had written about the Army's success story with this new body-worn computer, VR goggles. It, like, it's, there's no real good way to describe what they are. Um, it's too simplistic to just say they're new VR goggles, right? Because you can do navigation now and targeting. You can put, like, weapons on target now with these. Um, and we talked about how the Army could then use like its joint like tactical vehicle recompete to then network the two systems together and you get basically like, um, uh, you get, you know, the services think a lot about operating in degraded communications environments, you know, all that sort of those challenges at network security. Well, these two would then create their own organic network, so you don't have to be on a bigger one, right? You could, it's a lower electromagnetic spectrum, all the kinds of possibilities, right? But you're just using like GM and Tesla technologies, nothing fancy. You're just using it differently for the military. And, um, and so, you know, these success stories have to get out there so that Congress can then let them all, let the services continue to do uh, when they succeed, do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, with that, I'm going to thank you for joining us today. I, I really appreciate your insights. Um, you've talked on, touched on so many, so many issues that we're, we're interested in, in, in at, at NDIA and Emerging Technologies Institute, which is say, I, I hope we can have you back on future podcasts. Um, and, and I'd love to keep picking your brain on this, this range of issues. Um, I, you know, I argue we, we are in... I would love to come back. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yeah. I, I feel like... We, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I, we didn't cover enough ground, so we'll save it for part oh, two. Oh, absolutely. Always, always leave them wanting more. That's the goal. So, Mackenzie England, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> Truly appreciate it. Talk to you soon. <laughs>